The Institute for Advanced Catholic Studies is a research center here at USC that specializes in work from within the broad Catholic intellectual tradition. So don't think theology and history and philosophy. It's all that, but also the broad Catholic intellectual tradition in dialogue with natural science, in dialogue with the social sciences, in dialogue with the humanities, both around things like theology, but also around contemporary issues. We have projects on artificial intelligence in Catholic ethics. We have projects on the new generation of nuclear weapons and thinking about nuclear deterrence versus nuclear disarmament as a smart strategy in the 21st century. Projects on defending democracy. Also projects internal to the church, ecclesiology and Catholic public leadership. So it's this very, very broad mission um, where we do a number of things. A lot of what we do is bring together scholars around those kinds of themes to think together and write about those kinds of themes. Uh, and we publish books. There's a list of 20 books we publish over the last 20 years over on the table. But we also do other things. We do a, a fellowship program called Generations in Dialogue that brings together very young scholars just about to finish PhDs or recently completed PhDs together with senior scholars over the course of a couple years where they meet, talk about emerging themes. We have one just starting now on medical ethics and the impact of technology, the integration of technology into the human person, literally into the human brain, or CRISPR technologies, genetic technologies that edit human DNA, thinking from a Catholic point of view about those things. And then most relevant today, we have fellowships for faculty where we support fat, really uh, sharp, important faculty work over the course of a year or a year and a half on specialized terrain. And today we're uh, introducing someone to you who's been a, the, the fellow on one of those projects for the last year. But I'm not going to introduce him. I'm going to introduce my colleague, Dr. Becky Serling, PhD in history from USC, who's the executive director of the Institute for Advanced Catholic Studies and keeps many, many things going and thinks very, very well about all that we do. So, Dr. Serling. Thank you. Oh my goodness, it's a team. Um, we also have Kylie and Doug who are part of our team. So it's a great place to work. So I am delighted to introduce you to um, Dr. Brandon Badyanathan and to welcome you, Brandon, to USC. Um, he's the 2023 Hancock Fellow at the Institute. He's an associate professor and the chair of the Department of Sociology at the Catholic University of America in Washington, DC. And his research, which, okay, so, I helped pick him, so I think it's really cool <laughs> research. Um, but he examines how culture shapes human flourishing across a, a bunch of institutional disciplines and fields, including business, religion, and science. And he's been published widely in peer-reviewed journals. His research has been funded by grants from the Templeton Foundation, the Templeton Religious Trust, and the Lilly Endowment. He has mass, but bachelor's and master's degrees in business administration from St. Francis Xavier in Nova Scotia and IHEC Montreal, respectively, and a doctorate in sociology from Notre Dame. Um, he's the author of a book called Mercenaries and Missionaries, Capitalism and Catholicism in the Global South. He was born in Qatar and lived in Oman, India, the United Arab Arab Emirates and Canada before coming to the US. He lives in Maryland with his wife Claire and their six kids. It has been an absolute delight to work with Brandon this year and I know that you will enjoy hearing him discuss beauty at work, the role beauty plays in our lives and the work we do. Please join me in welcoming Brandon Vidyanathan. Thanks, Becky. Um, stand out here. Can you all hear me okay? Um, it's such a pleasure to be here. I've, I've, not, uh, I've been to LA once before and, and not been to USC before today, so it's really a delight to be here. Uh, I'm very grateful for this fellowship that I've, I've had here with the Institute for Advanced Catholic Studies and 
grateful to to Rich and Becky and and uh, Doug and Kylie for all the work you all have done in supporting me throughout this year and 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 uh, organizing this event today. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some work I've been doing on this topic of beauty uh, in relation to work, and that's for most of us. Uh, a pretty odd thing. Beauty is not a word we connect to work. Uh, most of us don't don't find work beautiful. But I want you to think uh, before we get started about an encounter with beauty you've had in your own lives. And it doesn't have to be the very first encounter with beauty you've had. But when you think of your childhoods, think of anything that comes to your mind, an image, a memory, um, anything that you remember that today you would say, that was beautiful. And just take a moment to think about what that experience was, that you would connect with beauty. And what about that experience makes you consider it beautiful? I want to tell you my, my experience that, that one of the earliest memories that, um, that I have, and for a lot of us, it's, it's you know, spending time with, uh, with loved ones. And, and I remember I have an occasion, I remember my mother teaching me to ride a bicycle. And I remember the smile on her face when I finally managed to figure out how to do it on my own without her having to run behind me. Um, but one of the most poignant memories that comes to mind has to do with food, and it has to do with this thing. Does anyone know what these things are? It's, it's a very weird close up. These are samosas. So they're like empanadas. They're these pastries. They've, they're stuffed with potatoes and peas and carrots. Um, and I have this constant recurring memory of, of between, being between the ages of seven to nine when I was in school in Oman. We were in an, in an Indian school for people from the Indian subcontinent who were guest workers in Oman, uh, whose parents were guest workers there, rather. And, uh, and I would go in the middle of the day to the school canteen, which was a hole in the wall, literally, where these two sweaty guys were passing out Indian street food. And, and I would bite into one of these crispy uh, samosas, which, which are crispy on the outside, soft on the inside, the spicy sauce. And there was this, this sort of dynamic explosion of flavors. But it wasn't just the sensory experience. It was also the context in which I was experiencing this, which was a time of a lot of, of turmoil in my life. My mother, who was a physician, was going through psychotic episodes. She was, she was developing schizophrenia when I was around seven or eight, uh, hallucinating at home. My home environment was chaotic. I hated school. I didn't like my teachers. Couldn't make friends very well. Uh, and so there was this strange experience in the midst of that of, of encountering something that was able to pull me out of, out of myself, right? So, so there's something about the harmony of these textures and flavors that for me was almost a promise that you know, no matter how bad reality is, there is something else that, that, that it has to offer. There's something that almost doesn't have to be there. It, it, it was a start, it was sort of bringing color into, into a black and white world, as you, you know, if you will. So, so there's something like that where, where reality can, can convey to you a promise that, that is a sign of hope. Um, so that is a consequence, a consequence of encountering something beautiful. But, but what is beauty, right? Um, what, what do we mean by this word? And a lot of people, when I, when I tell them that I, that I study beauty in, in relation to work, uh, the first question is, well, what do you mean by beauty? And, and maybe when I'd asked you all to think about an experience of beauty, some of you might have thought, well, what do you mean by that? Um, it's very hard, probably impossible, to really come up with a definition. Emerson said, you know, I'm warned by the ill fate of many philosophers not to attempt a definition of beauty. And that's going to be uh, a little bit of the stance I take today. Uh, it's incredibly vexing trying to define it. People have tried to do it for centuries. And there are a lot of attempts that, that, uh, that many have tried. And, and then there's just really no consensus. Um, one philosopher, uh, Roger Scruton, suggests that the best we can do is to come up with platitudes. So if you try to define truth, you, you end up with the same kind of problem. Uh, there, there is no satisfactory definition, but you can say some things about what it is. So you can say some things about beauty. You can say that beauty pleases us, that one thing can be more beautiful than another. A beauty is always a, a reason for attending to the thing that possesses it. Right? So truth is a reason for believing in something. Beauty is a reason for looking at something. And you don't have to have a further reason than that. Beauty is the subject matter of a judgment, the judgment of taste. That's what beauty is about. It's, about. it's about taste. And this is about the object, not just about how I feel, uh, but about something, some property of something outside of us. Of course, you could say that's a beautiful feeling. But even that then becomes an object that you're making a judgment about. 
Um, there are no secondhand judgments of beauty. If you find something beautiful and I don't, it, it's, a, it's an odd sort of thing for me to call that beautiful. But these are some platters. These are some ways in which we can get around a definition. We can, we can, we can say that it, it you know, has these properties. And it's not a topic that, that I came to naturally. You know, I, I, you know, as Becky mentioned, I, my background is in, is in business and, and then in uh, sociology. And it, it, was, it was when I was uh, in grad school, uh, maybe about 15 years ago, reading books by people like Rich Wood, that, that I, I was studying protest movements. And, um, and I came across this odd puzzle. So the, the work done in the field of, of uh, the sociology of social movements at the time was emphasizing the role of emotions in driving and explaining the rise of social movements. And, and one account said the best way to understand social movements is to, is to look at them as responses to negative emotional shocks. So it's moral outrage that drives and fuels protest. And I thought there was something missing with that account. Because behind any kind of outrage, behind any kind of negative shock, there has to be an underlying value of something that you, that you want to protect, the absence of which you are outraged by. So it seemed like there had to be some underlying good and some underlying sense of beauty that, that, that the protest was in response to. And around this time, I came across a fascinating book by a Harvard philosopher, Elaine Scarry, uh, called On Beauty and Being Just. And, and Scary says that something beautiful fills the mind yet invites the search for something beyond itself. It is decentering and unselfing. It awakens in us the desire to preserve and to share what is beautiful, even if it's not serving our self-interest. And the beautiful, almost without any effort of our own, acquaints us with the mental event of conviction. And so pleasurable a mental state is this, that ever afterwards one is willing to labor, struggle, wrestle with the world to locate enduring sources of conviction, to locate what is true, right? And this, this is what she says drives our quest for justice. It's our experience of symmetry in the world that makes us desire equality. I'm not entirely sure empirically whether these claims are tenable, but there was something to it. And it was around this time that I also started working on a large international project trying to understand the relationship between science and religion. And I was talking to scientists in many countries around the world um, it was the largest study of, 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 of science and religion. We had, we had surveyed 20,000 scientists. We had interviewed some 600 of them. And I was traveling to the UK and France and, and India and Italy and, and other countries, talking to scientists about their work, trying to understand the, the basis for why they labor in their conviction for truth. And many of them were, these are what we call bench scientists. So these are people who, they're not working in Google. They're not getting paid a lot of money there. But they're just as smart. They're working in, in universities, getting paid very little money, and, uh, and working very long hours, 20 hours, a week, 20, 20 hours a day in the lab, giving up their health, uh, sometimes giving up uh, time with their families. Why would they do it? And we would ask them in these interviews, you know, why do you make these sacrifices? And I was really surprised to hear many of them say, because it's beautiful. And they talked a lot about beauty. And that was a word that kept coming over and over, uh, kept coming up in these interviews with scientists. And I really want to understand. What's behind this? Why are they talking about beauty? What does this mean? And I started for the last five years studying scientists in, in four countries, uh, in India, Italy, the US, and the UK, uh, trying to understand what beauty means to them and why it matters. And, uh, and this has taught me a lot uh, that, that I'll share with you. But, but one of the things that, that it has, has helped um, disabuse me of is, is, is a certain stereotype of scientists that, that many of us, I think, have. Um, this is, this is an image that uh, children, before they visit Fermilab in, in, in the US, one of the largest uh, national labs, uh, they, 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 there is a study that's been done you know, for, for, for many decades where, where they take children to visit these scientists. And they ask them, can you draw a scientist and tell us what, what's in this drawing? Um, I think many of us have this kind of stereotype of scientists. right? So this is uh, a child who says to me, a scientist is bald and has hair coming out of the sides of his head. Scientists live in their own world, and the rest of society puts them there. Uh, again, this is not, we don't, we don't think of scientists as impassioned uh, seekers of beauty. Uh, the, 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 the stereotype I had of scientists was very much at odds with, with, with the people I was talking to and the narratives they were, uh, they were sharing with me. And it's not just science that has, or scientists who have this image problem, but science itself, which we can view as, as being overly rational and systematic and methodical, analytical and calculating. I mean, all these are true. But seldom do we think of science itself 
as beautiful. And this is a fairly old critique of science. Uh, it goes back, at least in the English-speaking world, to, to the romantics and uh, poets like Keats, who complained that Newton had destroyed the poetry of the rainbow by reducing it to the prismatic colors. And uh, in his poem, Lamia, he complains, do not all charms fly at the mere touch of cold philosophy? And he means natural philosophy or natural science. And this science, he said, would clip an angel's wings Conquer all mysteries by rule and line, empty the haunted air and nomad mine, unweave a rainbow. So the critique is science strips away from reality the beauty, the mystery, the magic, right? It's disenchanting. But in recent decades, scientists have started pushing back against this caricature, saying, no, nah, I don't think so. And Richard Dawkins, the famous Oxford biologist in his book, Unweaving the Rainbow, aimed precisely at Keats's complaint says that the feeling of awed wonder that science can give us is one of the highest experiences of which the human psyche is capable. It is a deep aesthetic passion to rank with the finest that music and poetry can deliver. It is truly one of the things that make life worth living. Mighty high praise, but is this kind of recognition of beauty and awe and wonder simply the prerogative of geniuses and celebrity scientists? Or does it apply to the ordinary practice of science? Right? Does the ordinary person working in a chemistry lab at USC, the ordinary scientist, experience the same sense of wonder and beauty uh, in science? Would, would, they, would, they, would they wax eloquent in the same ways? Um, that's what I wanted to know. And I wanted to understand, well, how prevalent is this, is this claim about beauty? Uh, what does it even mean to scientists? How do scientists experience beauty and awe and wonder in their work? How do these experiences shape the practice of science? Do they have any bearing at all on the work that people do? Does it affect the well-being of scientists? Uh, and then what, what can scientists teach us about beauty and, and why it matters, right? Is there anything we can learn from scientists? So this project, which was funded by Templeton Religion Trust, was, was conducted in these four countries, as I said, the US, UK, Italy, and India. We called it Work and Well-Being in Science because we didn't want to bias the study only towards those scientists who cared about aesthetics or beauty. Um, so we wanted to make it a study of something else, uh, which we weren't deceiving them about. We really wanted to understand how beauty had to do with well-being. But, uh, but we consciously avoided putting that word in, in the title of the study. And we reached out to, to some 20,000 scientists in physics and biology departments at PhD granting universities and research institutions in those four countries. Uh, close to 3,500 scientists completed our survey. We had about 6,000 who, who took it. Um, and so that's, that's a 15% response rate, which is um, which is all right these days in survey research. It's very hard to get anyone to take surveys. I personally delete every survey inv invitation I get, so I totally understand why many of them would not respond to me. Um, and we then conducted inter in, in depth interviews for an hour, hour and a half with, uh, with more than 200 of these scientists. And so what did we learn from these scientists about what beauty means and why it matters? Well, the first thing we learned is that there are three types of beauty in science. What I'm going to call sensory beauty, useful beauty, and the beauty of understanding. So sensory beauty, it's pretty obvious what that means. It's, it's the beauty in the, the sensory phenomena we encounter. So scientists encounter beauty in, in the things they study, in cells, in particles, in things they examine under the microscope or, or in the telescope. Um, one biologist told us, I personally think a pollinator visiting a flower, both of those things to me are incredibly beautiful. And the two of them interacting with each other, I think is one of the most beautiful things in nature, which is why I study pollination. Right, so, it's, so you can see the motivation there for driving them into their scientific careers. One Italian biologist told us, if you don't feel wonder in front of certain things, if you're not struck by the beauty and if it doesn't inspire this sense of wonder, this relentless curiosity, you cannot be a scientist because it demands so much of you. You need something to keep you going that comes from outside you. We asked the 200 plus scientists that we interviewed to share with us where in their work they encountered beauty. And many of them gave us images of things that they, that they find in their data, patterns in their data, images that they, that they come up with in their experiments, uh, the detectors that they build, the equipment that they build. So in all of these things, they find uh, pr profound beauty. And one, one scientist gave us this really fascinating example. This, she says, you know, if, if, if you did not know that these things on the left were bacterial needles, uh, you might have thought they were these pillars from ancient Hindu monuments. If you look at the structure of this, it's, it's striking how, 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 how much they resemble these architectural monuments. And so it's no surprise that 83% of scientists tell us that they feel that their research opens up new mysteries for them to explore at least a few times a year. 
So science doesn't strip away the sense of mystery. It enhances it, right? It deepens it. There's also beauty in uh, sensory beauty in their workplaces. So they talk about being in dark and dingy labs where they have no natural light and, and, uh, and how that, that is depressing. And then if you have access to a window where you can look at green space outside, it makes a huge difference. And so the sensory beauty matters even for the environment in which you're working. But that's just one kind. Then there is what we're calling useful beauty, which is the use of criteria like symmetry, simplicity, elegance, or aptness as heuristics or shortcuts to truth. That is, if a theory or an equation possesses these aesthetic properties, you're likely to think that it's true. Some scientists, like Nobel Prize winner Paul Dirac, went so far as to say that it is more important to have beauty in one's equations than to have them fit experiment. Because your experiment could be wrong. Maybe, maybe your equipment is not correctly calibrated, or, or experiments may not agree. But if you're, if you're sure that your mathematics is sound, and, and that is indicated by the beauty of the equations you've come up with, then you're, you're more likely to be on the right track. Murray Gilman similarly uh, said that another Nobel Prize winner said, said that in, in fundamental physics, a beautiful or elegant theory is more likely to be correct than a theory that is inelegant. Right? So, so pretty strong claims for the power of beauty in, in shaping theory choice in science. But not everybody is on board. Many beautiful theories historically were wrong, and ugly ones turned out to be right, and, and they were no longer considered ugly once they turned out to be right. Once upon a time, we thought that planetary orbits had to be spherical because the sphere was the most perfect shape. We don't believe that anymore, and we don't think of ellipses as ugly, but at a certain point, that was the judgment that prevented people from, from shifting from one aesthetic to the other. Other scientists, like Jim Baggett, argue that contemporary theories of supersymmetry, superstrings, the multiverse, and so on, which are driven largely by beautiful mathematics, are not only not true, they're not even science. They're fairy tale physics. Right? So, so there's this complaint that the, the, the kind of pursuit of, of beautiful equations in certain streams of, of physics today are just in principle untestable. You can't test the multiverse hypothesis. You can't go to another universe. So what do we do? Um, the, the German physicist Sabine Hassenfelder goes so far as to say that the pursuit of beauty in physics is leading physicists astray. It's, it's leading them to, to commit to ideas that are requiring billions and billions of euros of investment in building larger colliders and so on that are going to go nowhere because there's nothing behind those theories than the beautiful mathematics. So I'm not a physicist, but, but what we can do is we can ask scientists what they believe about these debates, right? Do you really think a beautiful or elegant theory is more likely to be correct than one that's inelegant? And we can ask them on a survey. What we find is that there's a lot of disagreement. Close to 40% of them disagree with the statement, but 23% agree. Right? They're, they're, they're somewhat divided there. Is mathematical, mathematical beauty a good indicator of scientific truth? 34% disagree, 27% agree. What about Paul Dirac's claim? Is it more important to have beauty in one's equations than to have them fit experiment? Now, in our preliminary testing, we had asked this question of both physicists and biologists. And the biologists wrote back to us and said, please don't ask this on, on, your, on, on your survey, because it, 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 it delegitimizes your survey, because it's such a stupid claim. Nobody could actually believe this. Um, so we only asked this of physicists. And even among physicists, 70% disagreed with this famous Nobel Prize winner, and 9% agreed. Right? So, so what is this saying? Uh, Beauty can be useful. And even in our interviews with these scientists, they tell us, yeah, you know, a beautiful equation, maybe it's worth investing in. But it can also be misleading. Right? It's not always a reliable guide. It might be helpful, but we need more. We need more than beauty. So the third type of beauty is what we think is the most important. And this is what scientists think they're, they're really in the business of doing. And, and this is what we're calling the beauty of understanding. One biologist we interviewed, who was a Nobel Prize winner, told us, it's recognizing, ah, this is what's going on. There's a leap to the truth, or a leap to a sense of generalization, or something that's beyond the particular, but in some way represents the real thing that's there, the real thing that's going on. And we think of that as beautiful. I talked to a poet once and asked him, what makes for you a beautiful poem? He says, when you read something and you're struck by the sense of, ah, this is how things are. And he used the exact same phrase that this Nobel Prize winner used in describing what, what is at the heart of beauty, right? both, both in science and in poetry. 
one UK physicist who herself is non-religious told us, you have those moments where it's just, I think it's like looking into the face of God for non-religious people. Or you can look at something and think, oh my God, that is how things actually work. That's how things are. So it's grasping behind appearances, behind phenomena, the hidden order or inner logic of things, right? And that, that is this, this profound sense of harmony, of fit, of things coming together. And it happens not only when you're, when you're trying to do experiments or theories, but also in teaching and also in collaboration. It's the thing that makes you want to run to your colleague in the neighboring uh, cubicle or booth and, and tell them, look at what I found, come and see this, right? Uh, it's the thing that, that excites you when your student has a light bulb go on in their eyes because they're grasping the same thing. They're understanding the same thing. So 62% of scientists tell us that encountering beauty in their scientific work motivates me to share the beauty of science through teaching or mentoring. 94% of scientists in our study experience a sense of surprise at discovering this hidden order or deeper systems underlying the phenomena they were studying. 87% report a sense of clarity as they saw how things fit together at least a few times a year. 86% say at least a few times a year they're thrilled by a new insight, right? So for these scientists, what they're doing is a quest for beauty. They're, they're on a quest for the beauty of understanding, and that is at the heart of, of the endeavor they're pursuing. And for most scientists, too, we find that, that encountering beauty is a source of motivation, right? For 62%, it motivated them to pursue a scientific career. 57% say it improves their scientific understanding when they, when they encounter beauty in their work. And 50% say that it helps them persevere when they experience difficulties or failure in their work. We also find further that the more frequently you encounter beauty in your work, the better your well-being, controlling for all kinds of factors statistically, controlling for gender and discipline and country and effects of the COVID pandemic, et cetera. Right? So the more frequently you're experiencing the sense of delight, the sense of awe, the sense of being surprised by the hidden order or inner logic of things, um, the better your mental health. Right? So this, this study has been, I mean, for me, uh, because it changed my understanding of what it, what it was to do science. It got me excited about everything from supersymmetry to uh, salmonella, which was that, that bacterial needle that I showed you about, uh, showed you earlier that the, that the professor was raving about. Um, and it, it led me to want to share this work with as many people as possible. And so I went from doing these confidential interviews with scientists to asking some of them, would you be up for a, a podcast interview? Can I take a uh, can, I, can I bring in a, a, you know, a, a camera and, and, and film what you're saying and, and put this up on YouTube? And I started a podcast and a YouTube channel exploring the role of beauty, uh, both in science and in, in other fields, uh, speaking to, to cocktail bar owners and, and restaurateurs and athletes and entrepreneurs and so on. We organized a symposium on beauty at work where we brought together scientists and um, executives and, and, and designers and architects uh, we, we organize salon dinners in cities around the world, uh, bringing together people for a conversation uh, around a three-hour dinner, and, and, and some of these events were, were also sp sponsored by the Institute for Advanced Catholic Studies here. Um, these are ways in which I've been learning that beauty seems to matter to people in a wide range of fields, and it really helps you reimagine and re-inhabit the work you're doing. And so going back to this question of what is, what is beauty, what have I learned from talking to people from these podcasts, from these... YouTube videos from these dinners, the symposia. Um, again, there's no easy definition, but it's, it's maybe, it may not be one thing, but it but may, be, may be 20 things, right? And some of those things are things like admirability and aptness and clarity and complexity and elegance and fit and harmony. And they vary. So, so for a biologist, they find profound beauty in complexity, in, in the tremendous complexity of, of a particular organism. Um, they don't like simplicity. They don't like a kind of reductive theory that can be boiled down into something you could put on a coffee mug. But that's precisely what physicists are excited about, the promise of a theory of everything that can fit onto a t-shirt, right? Um, so there's, there's some variation there, and, and yet it doesn't, there, there, it, it, it's not as though they're, it's so idiosyncratic that it's completely in the eye of the beholder, right? So, so there's, it's, it's not purely objective, it's not purely subjective. There's something else going on. I've, I've tried through this work to figure out ways for people to, um, to, to better think about where you can encounter beauty in your work and, and, uh, and how you can use it to transform the way you live your work lives. 
and, and harnessing some of these insights that have come out of these dinners and symposia, I've identified these five pillars that I'm calling of beauty at work, which have to do with, with various dimensions of, of the work we're doing. So there's, there's the sense of purpose, the sense of why. Why do you do what you do? And where do you find beauty in that sense of purpose? There's a sense of beauty in process. How are you working? Right? What, what, is the, what is the process through which you're carrying out the work you do? And that's often where burnout happens. So can you find a, a way of working that is, is, is something you could consider beautiful? What would that look like? What is it that you're actually doing? What are the products you're building? What are the services that you're, that you're building? What are the outcomes of your work? And where do you find beauty at that level? Um, the fifth one should, should say who. It's beauty in, in, in the relationships with the people. Who are you working with? Right? And where do you find beauty in, in, those, in those people? I don't mean physical beauty. I don't mean harass people in your workplace. I mean in the relationships with the people and the transformations that you see with people. And then there's where. Right? Where do you find beauty in the places and spaces you're in? And so I'll walk you through these. So, so what is beauty and purpose? So one architect I talked to told me that she sees her mission as creating something that's not simply ego-driven, it's not simply driven by what she, as the expert, uh, dis, uh, sort of dictates as beauty, but it's something that genuinely serves the client, right? So, so seeing your mission as, as being able to, um, to transcend what it is that, 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 uh, that would simply pad your ego and, and do something that, that, that is in, in genuine service to another. Uh, the, the work of Yale uh, management scholar Amy Rizhnowski shows that even a janitor at a hospital can find a beautiful sense of purpose in contributing to the healing mission of the hospital. Right? So it's not simply in the kinds of jobs that you would consider a high calling, but even in the simple things, one can connect what one does to a sense of purpose and find that to be beautiful. What does beauty and process look like? An icon painter told me about finding beauty in using a traditional technique that uses significant planning and organizing in a, in a fixed visual vocabulary. That's not something that a contemporary artist might find beautiful, right? That, that might seem oppressive, but, but for somebody, that, that constraint, that, that incredibly um, rigid constraint might precisely be the vehicle for beauty and, and even a vehicle for innovation. Because even in a, a tradition such as icon painting, one has to innovate. But one has to do it within, within very tight structures of, of, of constraint. And there's tremendous beauty that one finds there, right? But, um, but somebody who, who does improvisational jazz might, might have a very, very different set of, of criteria that for them would, would, would constitute beauty in process. Um, another person I talked to, an entrepreneur, uh, told me that she finds it exhilarating to embrace a nomadic, location-independent lifestyle. That's the process in which she works uh, in, in a way that, that she finds beautiful, right? The same person can find uh, beauty in, in working in, in, in profound silence for, for four or five hours a day and then, and then working for the rest of the day in a coffee shop that's noisy and bustling and full of activity, right? So the process can, can, can vary and, and what you find beautiful can vary depending on the need. Where do you find beauty in the products or outcomes of, of your work? Uh, I've had programmers tell me about beauty in writing an elegant piece of code, which is deeply satisfying at an aesthetic level, um, but also contributes to, to his sense of flourishing. Scientists tell me they find beauty in conveying complex findings through clear, simple, and accessible presentations, right? So that's a product in which you can, you can take delight, and you can say that is beautiful. There's beauty in the places and spaces you inhabit, and you can try to create those, those, those occasions for beauty. So if you're a technician working in a basement lab, but you can build into your schedule regular breaks to walk, get outside, uh, get some fresh air, sunlight, and green space that contributes to your sense of well-being, and that's where you find beauty in, in your work environment, and you extend the environment from your lab into the, uh, into the outside. Uh, this is something that, that good lab managers are attentive to and, and encourage. Um, one of my favorite interviews that I did uh, was, was an online fitness instructor, uh, one of the most popular YouTubers in the fitness space, who films his videos outdoors so that he can enjoy and share the beauty of nature. So you usually see him with a yoga mat outside a, a lake in Florida, watching out for the gators and, uh, and, and filming his, his yoga poses, right? So, so creating ways in which the, the physical environment can, can nurture the sense of beauty for you is important. And then finally, who? Uh, the people you work with are really important. The people you serve are important. And I've had executives tell me about how they were edified by the resilience shown by colleagues during stressful periods. So moral beauty, right, is, is really important. How do you 
see virtues exemplified in other people in the environment you work in. Uh, a retreat director told me about seeing personal uh, transformations in people who, who cultivate a deep connection not only to each other but also to the land and seeing that happen in people, being, being able to say I was, I, was, I was a catalyst in making that happen is, uh, is, is a profoundly beautiful experience. Right? So those are some of the ways in which you can try to think about your own life and the work you do. What would a more beautiful work life look like for you? What is one thing that you could do actively, maybe in the next day or week, that could change the way you imagine the work you do or inhabit the work you do? that would allow you to say at the end of that day or at the end of that week that this is more beautiful, right? And one of the things we have to think about in a context in which workism is a serious problem, our, our, our tendency to put all our eggs in the work basket to expect it to fill all aspects of our search for meaning and purpose is maybe part of that more beautiful work life would mean disconnecting from work and making work, at least the work you get paid for or consider your job, a smaller part of who you are and what it means to live a beautiful life. So I'll leave you with that, and thank you. You can learn more about this project at beautyatwork.net, and you can feel free to reach out to me at any point. Brandon V at CU.edu. It's been a real pleasure, and I look forward to your questions. There's a question. I don't know if there's a question up here on the chat. Nope. Yeah. I guess I'm curious about the intersection of like beauty and faith. Um, I think you read a quote of like a non-religious scientist who was like, it's the closest thing you get to staring at the face of God. Um, I, mean, I think as like a Christian, um, a lot of times like the beauty, like so much has been written in philosophy, in Christian philosophers, how beauty points us to God and like, and in that way, like science can kind of reveal literally the face of God. Um, did that come up in your interviews? Like, were you able to have these conversations? Yeah. What was the status of that? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, beauty, for those people, at least for scientists who are people of faith, beauty is really evocative, right? And, and so, and it can go in both directions. And it could be, we, we hear scientists say both that, you know, being in this environment, um, for me, is, is what, what allows me to experience God's love. And this is, this is where it happens. And, uh, you know, these are the experiences that, that reveal to me in new ways the, the way in which God works in the world. Um, and it could be just looking at something under the microscope and saying, I, I feel like I'm, I'm seeing God's fingerprints, you know, uh, in, 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 in layers of reality that no one else has access to. And there are others who have a more deductive approach and say the world is beautiful because God has created it and, uh, and God loves it and therefore, you know, the reality that I, that I uh, study is beautiful and mathematics is beautiful and so on. And, and so we see it both, both sort of uh, grounding them in their faith and also evoking their, their sort of spiritual uh, awareness or sensibility even more. Yeah. Uh, you remind me of Pope um, uh, Benedict the Sixteenth, who was a great writer, and uh, he talked about the way, you know, St. Thomas's transcendence, truth, beauty, and goodness, he talked about you know, how, in, how is it that, uh, you know, that we reach modern people? And uh, he talked about goodness, well, you know, that would be like another Teresa of Calcutta, but that's a more common sort of, of thing. Truth, uh, that, that is, you know, sort of taking a beating in the modern world. Huh? But he talked about beauty. You know, when you walk into a cathedral, immediately it's sort of an unfiltered, it goes right through any of the structures that you may have is defensive and goes right structure right to the heart and uh, that this is um, a, a modern way of, of evangelizing that is um, that would probably be most effective for, for others that uh, yeah. find trouble um, you know finding God yeah no I think there's something to that for sure yeah it's uh, I mean you're seeing at least in the, in the Catholic world, you know, the resurgence of the Latin Mass, and so you know, there's certainly a strong aesthetic drive that you know, is, is speaking to the hearts of many young people and, and, um, and driving that as well. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, I think, uh, yeah, they're all different pathways that, that draw people in different, I mean, some people are drawn to rational argument and debate and so forth, right? And so there's certainly, uh, the, 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 the pursuit of philosophy for, for many is also 
also drive. Um, yeah, I, 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 do, I do think it's an important vehicle of evangelization and it's, it's underutilized. Yeah. I think part, part of the challenge too is, is because there's, there's some tension there around well, what, who's, who's conception of beauty, right? And what kind of, um, you know, yeah, like is, is the Latin mass, you know, accessible to everybody or, you know, so um, when it comes to music, for instance, that's, that's, you know, a place where there's certainly a lot of, lot of dispute around what's beautiful music and um, some people say that, well, charismatic singing is, that's, that's ugly and, you know, but, but that works, right? And so, so it's, it's so, so I think there's, there's something to be careful about over there where we get too attached to our particular aesthetic, uh, uh, you know, maybe proclivities and, and expect uh, others to, to, to follow the same path. And if they don't, then we, we don't respect them, you know, so we have to do something about that. Yeah. So two questions, Brandon, maybe for you, maybe for others. Um, the first one, so two people might look at the same object, one finds it beautiful, one doesn't. Yeah. Um, makes me wonder, are there preconditions in the person mm. to be able to recognize beauty in a certain way? Yeah. What do we know about that, or what, what do we think about that in our own lives and experience? Yeah. And then a second one's a very different question. Is your sense of beauty and purpose had me with this image of, what about those, their whole purpose in life is money? Right. The collection of right yeah, image of the yeah. person with a pile of gold coins in front of right. them. Like, wow, this is Scrooge so McDuck. <laughs> is that an experience of beauty yeah. or is that something other than that? Yeah, yeah. That's great questions. Great questions. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well let me I mean yeah, I think I think it's really tricky. Um, so so some of the preconditions, you know, so there there is research that shows psychologically that um, you we do have different aesthetic dispositions. Uh, there's, a, there's a scale that we use, a psychological scale, developed by uh, a number of, number of people, including Dr. Keltner at Berkeley, um, which is called the trait awe scale. It's, a, it's basically sort of trying to say, like, are you the kind of person who's prone to experiencing beauty and awe and wonder everywhere in your life, right? And some people score very high on that and some score very low. And we find that among our scientists as well. There is a good bit of disparity. Um, and so, so part of it is, is how, you know, how you've been raised, and, and, and I think certainly personality plays some role in that. I see even in my, with my small children, some of them are much more attuned to aesthetic things than others are. Um, so so it's, it's kind of complicated getting at what is it primarily nature or nurture, and, and you know, is it, does it make a difference whether you grow up in a certain society? Uh, you know, and, and Italians talk about beauty all the time. Right? Does that does that mean that they're more aesthetically attuned? Um, it's interesting on that aesthetic disposition scale, they score the lowest in our in our study, and I think it's because there's probably some standard they have where, well, you know, my mother experiences more beauty than I am, but I'm in this dingy lab, so I don't see beauty around me every day, and they have a higher standard, and therefore they score themselves less, you know, maybe. So, um, but there there are, I mean, on the questions of like, I mean, you know, I, I showed you the samosa in the beginning, which which for me, you know, was when I was a kid, a profoundly beautiful experience, but probably wouldn't have been for a lot of other kids around me, where it was a very mundane, ordinary thing, right? So the context matters. There's uh, neuroscientists who say there are these three uh, systems in our brain that are responsible for generating an aesthetic experience as an emergent product. So so you have the sensory motor, you know, so all of the kind of sensations um, that are that are pleasurable. You have the emotional. Uh, valuation, emotional valuation system, and then and then there's a meaning making system. And so when something is, you know, y y deeply meaningful to you, and my mother made this dish. Maybe maybe someone objectively, a, crit a food critic, would say this is the, the the worst thing I've ever tasted. But if if this, it was important to you in your childhood, you would you would say this is this is the, the most beautiful thing I've ever tasted, right? So the meaning system would trump the sensory one in your mind. But but for the critic, it would be the opposite. Do you think mm. there's a virtue that helps us? experience beauty? Hmm. Or is beauty the thing that shapes virtue? This yeah. is like the Christian language or yeah. the Aristotelian yeah. language. Of yeah. Does it require yeah. a certain character yeah. inside of me to yeah. see beauty outside? Yeah. No, I, I'm inclined to think, yeah. I mean, I think, I think openness to how other people would experience something is really critical, right? So even if I don't judge something as beautiful, um, the ability to see, I can see how somebody else would find this beautiful, I think is really, really important. We can do that with, 
with all kinds of things, right? We can see with scientific theories that I can see why this theory was considered beautiful, you know, 1,500 years ago. I, we can't consider it beautiful today, but we have to have that ability to, to make that judgment. And I, I think there is a certain kind of virtue that, that goes into that. Um, yeah, that, that, I don't know, what, what is that virtue? I'm not sure. It, it, it relates to intellectual humility, I think, but I, I don't know. You had another question. Sorry? The, 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 the sitting in front of the gold coins. Or the yes, coins yeah, the greed, yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, I, think we, I think people can be mistaken in their judgments of beauty. I, so, I, so I think it's, it's, I think it's possible that, and so this, this is really, I think, the virtue kind of question around maturity, right? So when we are, um, yeah, we, 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 you could consider a person who is immature, uh, you know, finding beauty you know, in, in certain things that, that one would say, well, if they were to mature, they would not find that to be as beautiful, or they'd find something else more beautiful, but but I, I think for sure that money, power, status, uh, I mean the allure, right? Those things have. I I I do think you would have to call that a kind of beauty. Um, you know the, the there is there is something objectively good about about you know something like wealth, but but it's one would say a lesser good than a lot of other things, and it's the ordering that 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 seems to be the issue. Right? You look at. I mean, David and Bathsheba, right? Maybe there's objective beauty to this woman, but then des you know, desiring her to the point of committing murder and so on. Um, there's something else there you have to, you have to say that's, that's at work. Yeah, David. Thank you for the talk, it was really interesting. And I especially appreciated the part about the scientists who say, you know, the lab is dingy, I'm not getting paid, but I show up every day anyway. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I think a lot of people in the academy are would, they're like, I'm fortunate that I paid for this strange thing that I do, because right. I'd probably do it anyway. Yeah. Right? But I wanted to ask about the difference between that situation of essentially a kind of craft, mm. or someone who does it as a kind of mode of creativity or art, whether they're studying Shakespeare or mm. genomes or whatever, where it's, there's an intrinsic motivation. But, the, but then the, 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 the way that we think about beauty in the other situation, when people are doing it for a wage. Mm -hmm. And are there, you know, when you're thinking as a sociologist and we're thinking about the connection between the transcendentals of beauty and goodness or beauty and truth, how far in your work have you found that the individual can make sense of adjusting the beauty mm. of a wage workplace? And how much does that require a social question or a social solution? Mm. I think about, I always tell this joke for my students um, when we're reading 19th century philosophy that Slavoj Žižek said, you don't hate Mondays, you hate capitalism. Right, 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 <laughs> right, 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 yeah, yeah. Well, well, yeah. Usually not, you know, yeah. no, they're not working. Yeah. yeah. But the, you yeah. know, is, is there? Is, yeah. Do we have to address beauty at work at a structure or yeah. a social level? And what yeah. are the consequences? Yeah. Yeah. No, for sure. I think I think one of the problems. I mean, so this. Yeah. I mean, there's there's a way in which you can read what I'm saying as well. This is just sort of, uh, you know, a, a, allowing us to sort of bypass the problems with the structures that are creating the absence of beauty, and putting the the, the onus on the individual to figure out right how to make their uh, their their work more palatable so that the system can continue. To exist and so forth, and I, so I so I think there is a danger there. Um, I mean, even with these scientists, you know, I mean, like, yeah, I could say, well, you know, you can find beauty by stepping outside your dark, dark dingy lab onto the campus, but your supervisor has to allow you to do that, and if you're in an environment where that's not going to happen, that's a problem. If you're, if you're, I mean, this is the the general finding too from our study is is uh, you may be drawn to become a scientist because you find. Uh, beauty and understanding how certain mechanisms work, you know, in, in cell biology, but then you realize most of your time is spent uh, when you, you know, uh, f get past the grad student stage, chasing after grants, writing grant proposals, trying to figure out how to deal with office politics, trying to, you know, deal with um, ornery students, or, you know, I mean, that, that's how you spend most of your day, and, and that's, that's, you know, a different kind of system that, and especially when it comes to things like grants, you have to overinflate your claims in order to, to, to get any kind of funding. And there goes the intellectual humility that you were drawn to in the first place, right? And um, so the conditions are a big, uh, big issue, the structural conditions that, that I think make it um, sometimes for some people close to impossible to experience beauty and then they end up leaving because they say there's just, there's just no way uh, under these conditions that I can actually pursue the thing that I find beautiful. Uh, it's also used, by the way, as a, as a kind of cudgel, as a, as a kind of, uh, 
uh, maybe even a way to 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 exploit people. And we've I've had uh, you know one of the one of the people we interviewed was uh, a female physicist who said for a number of years she was denied tenure even though she had she had qualified you know she had over exceeded the criteria in her department. And people were telling her things like why are you asking for a promotion? You should do this uh, you know just out of love, out of passion. Um, you know that's that's you should do it out of a sense of vocation, right? So so there is a way in which it can be used against people. I think that's problematic. So. Um, I don't. I don't think that that danger is is, uh, is something we can we can dismiss. I think we have to take it seriously. Yeah. Yeah. Is the ability to appreciate beauty because you can give up control and allow awe and wonder at what you don't understand? <clears throat> yeah. I mean, I think. I think. So. So I think we have to be open to surprises too, right? And when you are really tightly fixated on, I have to make this experiment work the way I want it to, you're not open to surprises. You might see some result that's not what you wanted and then leave it and not realize, actually, if somebody had been more open to it, they would have realized there's something else there that's an entirely different research program or, or maybe you know, an unexpected finding that solves some other puzzle, right? So, so I think, um, yeah, giving up control in the sense of, um, being open to, to, to being surprised, I think, is important. Yeah. yeah does uh, living in the moment, uh, where does that fit in to this mm. concept of beauty? And, uh, hmm. does, that, does that have a place in your, in your opinion? Yeah, I think so. I mean, living in the moment in the sense of, of again, just having openness to things that you're, rather than just sort of sticking to your preconceived plans, right? Um, yeah, I think so. Um, I'm trying to think of good examples of that. Um, you know, I, I, I think it's a practice that, that in itself, I mean, going back to the intrinsic and extrinsic, right, I think it's related to that, right, because, because living in the moment is sort of, part of it is, is you want to, to be present to reality and, and not just sort of be driven by whatever schema you have concocted, right, or someone else has, has, has set for you. Um, I think I think it's it's a condition for experiencing beauty. I mean, you know, you won't you won't see you, you won't attend to it if you're not present, right? So, um, yeah, it's. I mean, there. I, I think the stress, pressure, like those things are obstacles, right, to to encountering beauty. I remember once um, uh, being on a being on a on a hike in 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 the, uh, the mountains of Tennessee. Um, and I had a really bad uh, stomach upset, and I couldn't, I had these people around me commenting on how beautiful this place was, and I had no receptivity to it, because all I wanted was a bathroom. And so <laughs> it was really, there, there are ways in which you can be constrained, right? And um, yeah, I, I, I think, uh, I think that the, the institutional context we're in and the pressures we experience can prevent us from living in the moment and being attuned to that. Ma'am, you had a question? Yeah. yeah. And I don't know if you, you know, accounted for that. I, I don't know that, you know, you would see beauty ever. Mm. I don't, yeah, it's a, it's a good, I mean, so we, we have, you know, there is, there's a correlation between sort of happiness and an aesthetic experience. It, it um, you know, do you, do you have to be happy in order to even be attuned to, to beautiful things, right? And I think it's a good question. I think there's, it, it, it could run the other way. You could be surprised by things that, that you know, like, um, I, I mean, I think it depends on the context. I mean, if you have, you know, there's a hard deadline tomorrow and your job is at risk, then I don't think you'll pay attention to anything beautiful. But, but maybe if it's, you know, it's stressful, but, you know, at a lower threshold then maybe you can and something can break through. Um, but you know, the other thing too, which is really puzzling, is the great work by Susan Cain in, in her book, Bittersweet, that came out a couple of years ago, shows that you know, sadness and, and melancholy are, are really important for, for, at least in the, the realm of music and art, for our experiences of beauty. So we're not drawn to happy songs, we're drawn to sad songs. Most of our playlists um, will have sad songs in them. And, and there's something really powerful there about, about that longing, about that desire, and, and why it is that art can transform pain into, into beauty, right? Um,
but yeah, like where where are the uh, where are the the songs about happy marriages? Like, who's listening to them? Um, you know, uh, what's there's something going on there, and and so so I, so I do think that even even the absence of happiness, I think, is an occasion for finding beauty, and it's a different kind of beauty. But 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 art and you know music and so on, I think, can can take us there. Yeah. So in the question of like sense of purpose and. Um, talk about beauty in the workplace. I'm wondering what you would say to someone who uh, is striving towards beauty and what they do. So for context, I'm, I'm a classical musician, I'm a violinist, so what I do every day is trying to make something beautiful. And I have profoundly deep convictions that it is beautiful. Mm. But the problem is, is that especially, and I see it all the time, especially my disillusioned colleagues as well at music school, that like, it's so discouraging to feel like the rest of the world doesn't mm. value it in the same way, even though we have these deep-seated convictions because beauty's meant to be shared. So how do you fix your sense of purpose when it feels like very few other people care to even try to experience what you are profoundly, uh, profoundly convicted by? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, I think academics have the same challenge, right? <laughs> Scholars or scientists working on some really obscure thing. I mean, even these scientists I talk to are, they're not, you know, curing cancer. They're not, you know, building, you know, your, your latest gadget, right? They're, they're working on some really obscure mathematical problem that no one has solved for several hundred years or, you know, something like that. And, and, and I think they're, they're, it's the same kind of problem. And um, I don't know what, what a good solution is to that. I mean, certainly there are things that help, like the more time you spend with, with others who validate what you're doing, right? Um, that, you know, so, so then your community kind of um, helps you mimetically, right? By, by imitating the desires of others, and if, if the people around you desire the same thing, then that, that sort of reinforces it for you. Um, but you know, unfortunately, that's that sort of sounds like I'm advocating staying in a bubble and not connecting with the outside world. Uh, I, so I don't know. I mean, it's it's uh, it's a hard thing for a lot of people. I've I've and I certainly have talked to to scientists who say, you know, I I don't know if I can keep doing, especially once difficulties get in the way. Right? You're like, okay, I can't I can't seem to find a a, a job. I can't seem to uh, you know to get another postdoc, etc. Those are moments when, when you start to question everything and say, well, why am I doing this? Who cares about this? If no one's willing to pay for it, maybe it doesn't really matter, right? So that's a hard thing to endure. Um, we have a lot of scientists who've left academia, gone into industry for that reason, and, and they kind of miss something about, about that world they've given up. Um, and some of them come back and say, you know, I, I, I missed this, this, the autonomy or the, the, the ability to pursue my, my own, you know, um, research program. and. Uh, and so maybe sometimes, you know, that exiting and then returning is another pathway for some people. Um, I don't know. Does anyone else have a solution to this? I'm not really sure how, how one would, would sustain. Because I think lots of us experience that frustration. Whatever we yeah. love most passionately, those around us don't love. I think a lot of us, I'm in late midlife, but in, a lot of us in midlife try to solve that through generativity, engaging with a younger generation. That's why I teach, I think, to try to mentor a younger generation into some sense of shared appreciation for something like playing violin. Um, so generativity might be one, one response to that. Yeah. Yeah. I had a thought on your question about the beauty of living in the moment. I'm interested in other people's thoughts on. Because that sounds exactly right. True to my experience, there's a kind of beauty of just shedding all the pressures living in the moment. But it's in a certain tension with the way that some forms of beauty, to even begin to appreciate them, require really strong discipline that's not living in the moment. It's learning to play a musical instrument, science. Um, for me, fly fishing is an experience of beauty, and that there's serious discipline to that. What do we make of that relationship of living in the moment to the discipline required? Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure how to think about that. Yeah, yeah. So this is like heightened attention, then heightened sort of almost the complete, you know, absence of attention, right? When you're, uh, and because because the discipline can get you to that point where you're you're not really, you don't have to think about every, you know, if you're playing a, an instrument, you don't have to think about the next note. 
Right. And is part yeah. of the experience of beauty the tension between those two things? Mm -hmm. Or the back and forth between them? Either one of them would get boring and not beautiful by themselves, but yeah. it's the, the journey back and forth. Yeah, there's, I mean, the, you know, opposite ends of the spectrum are, are flow states and experiences of awe, right? So flow states where you're completely sort of, you've, you've, you've forgotten yourself. Flow state? Flow, yeah, state of flow, right? When you're, when you're really working on something intensely and you don't realize that time has passed. You, you know, four hours have gone by and I'm, I've been working at this thing and I didn't even notice. Um, and, then, and then awe is the opposite where, where the sense of time is somehow stretched where you, you feel like, you feel like you've been there for hours, but it was only a couple of minutes, right? And um, you're just pulled out of yourself, and you know. So, yeah, they're very different kinds of aesthetic experiences, it seems. Just to comment on your uh, example there, uh, being in the stream with all your senses uh, alive, yeah. you know, there's the sound, the sight, mm -hmm. and then laying a fly, yeah. exactly. <laughs> That's, that's a great, uh, beautiful moment. A fellow fly fish had a couple of us. In a long life. <laughs> Any last questions, comments, reactions? Uh, this kind of goes back to the economic implications of this kind of work. Did you find that uh, the implication being beauty lends itself to positive emotional experiences, especially in the workplace. Uh, I, would, I would venture to guess that people who are having positive emotional experiences at their workplace are more productive. And I, I'm not advocating for capitalism, but I'm just like, uh, if we seek beauty in the workplace, does it inadvertently support this kind of capitalist assumption of higher productivity, more work, more outcomes, right. I guess, for yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, Marx's words are flurry around uh, my head, but yeah, uh, yeah I'll tell you that. Yeah, that yeah. No, it's a good, yeah, so I don't, I don't know necessarily, it depends on what you mean by productivity, right? So are you cranking out more widgets as a result? Um, maybe not, right? So I think of like uh, Patagonia where, um, they're, they're, because they're you know, not, not a publicly traded company, they could do this, but their CEO says, you know, you, you're not allowed to work more than a certain number of hours, and you have to go and surf when the surf's up, right? So you're required to do that. Um, there are companies I know where you're required to disconnect from email weekends and evenings. You're not allowed to check email, right? So are you more productive uh, or less, right, in those contexts? And you know, maybe, maybe in the time that you're present, you're present f more fully. Um, but maybe your output's less. Maybe, maybe your sort of rate of growth is not going to be accelerating. Um, so, I, so I think it depends on what we mean by, by productivity in those cases. Um, but I think so, certainly those kinds of cultures are probably what we would consider more beautiful, more humane in some way. But, but, but I don't think that that, that kind of standard of accelerating growth, you know, your, your returns are going up year on year, you know, at the same rate, um, that's not sustainable. And, and I don't think don't think a beautiful way of working is compatible with that model. So, so I think it poses some challenges for certain kinds of capitalism. Yeah. Well, been a delightful conversation, everybody. And Dr. Brandon Vajayapa, delightful to have you here. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.